Splice Poetry Series. My name is Henry Gordon. John Monroe. So we're a reading series, if you don't know, that started in January of 2022, and we're a monthly series uh, in, the Bywater, in the Bywater for second Saturday at Saturn Park. And the way that we operate is we bring in one outside poet, pair them with a local poet, and of course, splice them together. So that's what we do. So today, we thought that we would open with some poems that frame our thinking behind the philosophy of the importance of live readings. And so I'm going to start us off with a poem by Nikanor Bara called The Situation is Getting Delicate. You only have to look at the sun through a smoked glass to know things are bad. Or maybe you think everything is fine. I say we ought to go back to cars pulled by horses, to steam-driven planes, to TV sets cut from stone. The old folks were right. We have to go back and cook with wood again. This is in two parts. I had one that's, I think, in conversation with the Para poem. This is from the Seneca Nation, and it's called A Song of My Song in Three Parts. It's translated by Jerome Rothenberg. It's off in the distance. It came into the room. It's here in the circle. My thinking behind choosing these two poems at the root of a reading is a certain tribalism that I'm attracted to, naturally primitive, a gathering of bodies breathing the same air in the same place. I think this is so important, maybe the most important thing that poetry and any kind of reading can do, is bringing people together. I like the idea of this disembodied force it's floating around, it's unactivated, until we all get, much like right now, in the same room together. This, for me, is at the heart of why a reading is so, not just valuable, but essential to a literary scene, to a culture, to developing new ideas and exchanging them. And it's something that's outside of us, but also within us that only, again, can be activated when we're all together. And that was my thinking for me. Yeah. We have problems. I, by the way, we're not aware of, uh, we didn't rehearse it. Um, you know, we just say we, we uh, took a poem that uh, sort of psychically propels us into, you know, sort of splice, reading, readiness, you might say. Um, among, among the many poems that you could have chosen, but I have a question for you, um, Henry, that, that first poem of Nika Marbara, very interesting poem that you wrote. But um, there's there's a lot of uh, interesting incongruities there, right? Like things that are, you know, that that, that could not happen in like, a part stone or these things and, and so how do these sort of you know real in, say you might say the like, uh, real life uh, things, the magic of these incongruities, how, how, how did the, why why does that inspire you? Well, I think going back to that final line, cooking with wood again, getting back to the basics, goes back to the OG poetry. What is poetry? Well, it starts with breath. It started with orality. It started with sound in, in person. And so I think that the reason that I chose that aura poem was that for Spice, for me, it's getting back to basics. It's getting back to the essential quality poetic selfhood, of poetic participation. And so I think that... I'm guessing. Um, and so the, they are playing, speaking of Woodrick, 
on different technologies, but the technologies are warped, they're clashing with the old and the new, and I think that's exactly what we spliced. Or I'm reading sorry. Right. In, in that, that Seneca uh, poem, uh, they chose from uh, Shaking Pumpkin, the Little Mountain Birds anthology, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, what was that from? Temptation to the Sacred. No. Shaking Pumpkin. Shaking Pumpkin. Okay. Century. So, Jerry Elliott, well, well, just uh, for those of you that don't know, Jerry Rotten Birds, um, you know, ethnographical uh, uh, poetics, uh, he goes really back in time from all over the world, right? Far back, any kind of culture, whether it's you know, Russian Legion or uh, you know, Louisiana, uh, you know, the American continent, and you look for like um, all these cultures way back to sort of refound, right? Sort of uh, found like, the modern moment. It's like it's like it's really from sort of avant garde tradition, um, and he he thinks he could find he could find different kinds of avant garde. So I find it very compelling uh, that those two poems you know, put together. Because uh, one of them is, is kind of like a technology that's Right, and that's why, that's why I asked to start with my poems, because I felt that that was kind of, for me, it's the root of the reading series. And then we'll kind of branch out from there. So, Sean, do you want to? Yeah. For a poem here, right here. Uh, this is a poem by John Anderson. It's called The Secret of Poetry. When I was lonely, I thought of death. When I thought of death, I was lonely. I suppose this error will continue. I shall enter each gray morning, delighted by frost, which is death, and the trees that stand alone in mist. When I met my wife, I was lonely. Our child and her body is lonely. I suppose this error will go on and on. Morning, I kiss, kiss my wife's cold lips, nights her body dripping with mist. This is the error that fascinates. I suppose you are secretly lonely, thinking of death, thinking of love. I'd like, please, to leave on your sill just one cold flower whose beauty would leave you inconsolable all day. The secret of poetry is cruelty. So that's a very jarring last line. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, John. It's a very jarring last line to think of like poetry as something cruel that we like kind of inflict upon each other. But I mean, being honest and being open and being truthful is kind of a cruel act sometimes. Someone comes up to you and like, hey, your shoes look like shit. They're being honest, but it's kind of cruel. Um, so this is kind of more of an emotional take than a technological take on it. Um, poetry is a very lonely act. You know, we're all like huddled in our rooms, or some of us in cafes, but you're still kind of focused and alone in writing from your experiences and from your own psyche as an alone person. Um, reading really gets it out there and helps you connect and kind of, you, can, you know, you're up here reading or you're up somewhere reading, and you kind of connect with someone's eyes and you feel that they feel it. And it, kind of, it makes you, you know, generally less lonely. So it's kind of a good public act to participate in. Poetry doesn't exist if we just sit at home and write it and read it in front of the mirror. It's, that would be a waste of space and time. But here we are in a real space and time sharing it with each other. So that poem kind of brings about an emotional connection to the readings and to the reading series. And I like to see that in Splice. There's so much social atmosphere there. It's great there beforehand talking and drinking and crowds and stuff. Where they're after talking and drinking press. It's the social aspect of it that really gets me involved that I really love the most about Swags and poetry readings in general. Hanging out with all of y'all, talking poetry, talking shop, doing all of your love. I like this, uh, this, uh, this uh, you might call it a form of theater, where, um, where things are so carried out, and even in that poem, that in, anything that sort of happens in, in the poetry reading. Is a surprise with a sort of edge of, of cruelty, not, not only in the, um, the sort of the breaking of silence, mm -hmm. right? Um, but also, um, um, but, but also, um, you know, just uh, accepting you know, highly pared down, alienated spaces. Mm -hmm. And I don't, you know, what if this is people would do that, right? Like, what if you can't go to uh, uh, you know, sociology, like that lecture on sociology? 
theology is to take off, so to speak, all your psychic garments and to confront people and say, well, here's my study. Uh, but in fact, the poetry is to do exact, exactly that. So there's things that you can do in this, 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 this weird art form that you can participate in that, um, that yeah, there's like a, obviously, you know, theater, poetry, you know, uh, or so, you know, theorize that, that whole, um, the whole aspect. In, in, in his case, uh, contagion. You know, he, he, was, he was pretty uh, adamant that uh, that the poetry was a sort of sickness. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and sickness is 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 a cover for uh, sickness and stuff like that. So I like that. It's a very cool poem. I prefer to be afflicted by poetry constantly. Oh, you want that? I love I love German. I I really like what you said, Sean, about that idea of it feeling like a very solitary act, and I think that the reading breaks through that idea that it's, it, it does feel lonely at times, but there's something about the breakdown of the self from the poem, your poem, spoken out loud into the into the ether of a crowd or an audience, that now suddenly it's it's not so lonely, but maybe it's you know a little painful to let go of those things because it's not really yours anymore. Right. It's, it's, it's being fractured, it's being put out there. Maybe fractured isn't the word, but simply shared. Yeah. And so it's sort of the burden is shared by the whole... It is a burden, right? I mean, it's not... As, as most of us in this room are writers, it's not easy. Um, it's a painstaking process. But you put it out, and it's, it, then it turns... This painstaking process turns into this massive celebration, sometimes small, sometimes large. I mean, uh, so I think that's just a perfect poem to bring it. Yeah. And I think that's why sometimes we, um, when we try to invite our readers from the outside, uh, you know, uh, we try to bring in people who think that, um, that are sort of in a, in a, in a sort of shock state, and they're sort of, uh, you know, engaged in some form of corruption, right? And we're ready for that. We're, we're ready to, you know, take it down. But, so to speak, like, if, you know, go down a little shit uh, of the poem you know, the person's writing. So, so we, we want to be vulnerable to that. Um, should I? Yes, read some poems. All right, so, so what we're talking about here is, um, you know, we're, we're sharing poems that, um, but again, that that inspire us, um, you know, not only personally, not only our practices, but that inform our, what we think of, of that phenomenon called reading, which I think, I think that that phenomenon of reading should always be thought of as an open space, not, oh, well, I'm going to read, I don't want to read, I'm going to read without it. Well, no, the, the, what happens is the reading should, should reshape your conception of the reading uh, altogether. Uh, otherwise, why, why keep doing it? So, anyway, but this is a poem by Bertolt Brecht that I return to over and over over the years. Um, that, that really prompts me to, to be thought. Now, Brecht in the, in the 1930s was on the run from the Nazis, and he kept with him very, um, very few things in his, in his suitcase, you know, manuscripts, things like that, his clothes, parachutes, whatever. And this curious little poster that he's preparing about to fold out, kind of like a calendar, you know, he kind of folds out like a bamboo thing, he relies on the Asian art. And he carried around this picture of a sort of meditating man on a kind of ledge. Um, and it was called that painting, I don't know what it was called that, but he, he called it the doubter. And, and everybody knew that, you know, if you're going to have a rehearsal with, uh, with Bertolt Brecht, but he, he hang up the, the doubter, like the little, the little, the little thing, they call it the doubter. And this is a, this is a poem that, that accompanies that, that the practice that he had. Uh, Whenever we seem to have found the answer to a question, one of us untied the string of the old rolled up Chinese scroll on the wall so that, so that it fell down and revealed to us the man on the bench who doubted so much. I, he said to us, am the doubter. I am doubtful whether the work was well done to devour the days. 
whether what you said would still have value for anyone if it were less well said. Whether you said it well, but perhaps were not convinced of the truth of what you said. Whether it is not ambiguous, possible misunderstanding, your responsibility. Or, it can, or if it's too unambiguous and takes the contradictions out of place, is it too unambiguous? If so, what you say might be useless. Your thing has no life in it. Are you truly in the stream of happening? Do you accept all developments? Are you developing? Who are you? To whom do you speak? Who finds what you say useful? And by the way, is it sobering? Can it be read in the morning? And is, all, is, it, is it also linked to what's already there? Are the sentences that were spoken before you made use of, or at least refuted? Is everything verifiable by experience? By which one? But above all, always above all else. How does one act if one believes what you say? Above all, how does one act? Reflectively, curiously, we study the doubter, the blue man on the scroll, looked at each other, and made a fresh start. That's, that's the doubter. I carry on the scroll now too. In a way, I'm yeah, well, that's a little bit. <laughs> so it's interesting about how does one act, and it kind of you have a massive amount of experience going at motion reading and seeing your perform, performing in different ways. And you mentioned earlier um, how the kind of phenomenon of reading like shifts based on like, who you go see perform, who you go see read. Uh, is there a moment in your life where you kind of saw a reading and that kind of changed your conception of what a reading could be? Oh, absolutely. Um, even here tonight, um, a, lot, a lot of shifts happen. I mean, I, you know, if, if this wasn't transformative in a way, I don't, I don't know what the point would be. <laughs> in a way, right? I mean, uh, so yeah, there's been that. Um, but I, I want to do sort of clarify a little about the, the how does one act, right? That last line, right? I don't, I don't think he meant like how does one act the block, I'm gonna throw a stone, you know, like the bank or whatever. I don't think he meant just that. I think it's like he also meant it like an ethical plane, a moral plane, right? The mind maybe maybe shifts in the heart, how you feel towards something. Somebody sometimes gets up in the phone and they 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 say something that's Way about the situation that you know, opens up and opens you up. You know, you think, wow, I'm going to grow hard ass until now. You know? Yeah. I think that idea of, of a reading with the doubter being present, that idea of this, this sort of thinker, is sort of not just with the reading, but within all of us as writers. How many times have you been to a poetry reading or any reading for that matter, and, and the person goes up and they go, oh, I'm really nervous. I'm really, really nervous right now. That is not, that's a good thing, because it shows that there's no room for complacency within a reading. That shows that the person cares, that there is a standard to which they're trying to achieve and they want to affect the audience in a certain way. They want it to be really good and effective. They want to transform the space, and sometimes that gives you the jitters. It makes perfect sense. But that idea, because that's a, that's a hard poem. I, I, I know the doubter, we've read the doubter. Um, is what you say too ambiguous? And then he kicks it back in your face. Is what you say too unambiguous? It's like, what do you want from me? What do you want from me? But that's a good thing, to, that's a good place to be in, is, is a highly, you should scrutinize your work, and you should do it through the filter of a reading. How did it land? How did this poem work in this space at this time? And there's so much that you can learn from, yeah. like in terms of editing the poem that you just read, right? Or, or, yeah, that's that's right. I think what the way I'm understanding what you're saying is that there should be a sort of a, um, a sort of a, uh, an openness again to uh, to um, volatility, right? The volatility instead of you know, you know fixing. Um, but what do we? I know we 
we also um, decided that we would ask each other a sort of question. Um, yeah. Just out of the blue. Um, we don't, this is a, a, it's a pop quiz. We, so we said we're not going to tell each other what questions we're going to ask each other to. So if you want to show you one, you want to ask us a question? Whatever question you want to ask. Oh, let's see here. Henry. Or Henry. Or Henry. Or Henry. Or Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, considerations do you take when you think of inviting an outside visiting here to Swipes? What do you think about it? What do you like? Um, well, of course, we're Democratic. We all green light anything. There's no, there's no like, oh, that's veto power. <laughs> yeah, there's no like, hey, we're going to have this person because I said so. Um, I think I consider. I think we all consider honestly. Right? I don't really think it's the most uh, sort of veto. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think though that it's about the pairing, right? It's about the splice. It's about who are we going to throw in the ring, so to speak, with the other person. Sometimes it's very combustive. It's sort of like there's sort of a, a conflagration that happens. There's a incongruity sometimes that can be really enlightening. Other times it's like a mantra, like, oh, there's are their diction is very similar. Kind of as it shifts, like, what, like, right now, what is a criteria that you're particularly interested in? I mean, I think we all think about, and this is really spoken largely, that you think, we, I mean, we all attend, there's so many readings here, it's such a robust, lively community. The list goes on, I mean, there's at least like seven others besides us. It's not like we're, we're not involved in the world of readings. And how, like, what can we, who do we have access to that maybe others don't? And then also, what does the community at large, in, in my mind, what could we use right now? What could we use? I, you know, I'm in conversation with so many poets and writers, as we all are, having conversations about aesthetics and poetics, and I'm thinking, this would be perfect at this moment, having this person's work presented to us in a reading. Yeah. Um, I would, I would So my question goes back to these different, there's these different sort of nodes that uh, a writer's career has, right? There's readings, journals, books, fellowships, the list goes on. And so what I wanted to ask the both of you is where do you place the live, in-person reading in that hodgepodge mix? And what advantages does the reading have over these, I think, overvalued other pockets, the book, the journal, the byline, the big dog, right? How does, if, in, if you think it does, the, the importance of a reading supersede that? For, for me, um, the, the, the possibility that there might be nothing to is very real. Like, not only personally, but other people. Like, sometimes when people get up to read the mic, and I think this is a fair thing, and I think, you really have nothing to say. Regardless. And, you know, it follows as a sort of delight, you know, because you really see at a base level that, that many people, that's kind of where they began with the poem. So there's this breach of, like, I had nothing to say until then, and it happens over. I think it, it speaks, I, so the reading is like a, like it's a, it's a form of theater, like over and over, in, in, in all these myriad, myriad of ways. And so that's kind of what I think about. I kind of see the readings as almost like an editor show. Like I've gone to so many readings, I've done a reading, and I think, oh, this poem's going to be great, everybody's going to love this poem. And like the poem that you think is just like, oh, it's kind of, we should watch it. The poem you think is great is totally fucking bombs. And then the poem you think is wish watching people love, and you're like, just recalibrating your entire kind of aesthetic of poetry. You're like, hmm, I didn't really think this would work this way, it would work that way. One thing that's also free um, about readings is uh, this is a little bit personal for me, I guess, is that it kind of helps me to like see it, think about who the audience is. Like, what am I going to write for this audience? What am I going to give to this audience? Like, having 
having an idea of exactly who's going to be there. Because in this city, we've got enough readings and stuff. I know you're going to be there. I know you're going to be there. I know some of y'all are going to be there. And I kind of have some of, of an idea about you know what y'all will tolerate and what y'all will not tolerate. <laughs> I, think that's a, I think that's a good point. It reminds me of something that uh, Carolyn Henry said to me once about, you know, a lot of times you're going through school or you're, you know, you're trying to learn more about your craft. And there's this sort of theoretical question that can really, I think, be difficult for somebody starting out to answer. It. Oh, well, who's your audience? Who's the audience for this work? It's such an empty question at first. But it fills in with the reading because you know exactly who your audience is. And Carolyn said to me, well, you know who your audience is. You've seen their faces. You do readings. You go out there. And that's it. Yeah, I, I, this, this segue is really nice to you. Those wires together, that's called a power cord. 
You're plugging it in. You're plugging it into the scene. I'm going to Liminal. I'm going to Spice. I'm going to Rubber Flower. I'm going to Twisted River. Right? Um, and, and I think that if you start losing sight of the importance of the, the cultural exchange of ideas that's happening there, you're testing your own work, like the doubter, right? You're testing your own work. And so I guess like the thing that sometimes, and I get it, there's, there's, we all have our spells, but maybe the thing that worries me the most is when somebody's just been reading the same poem over and over again and I've heard it too many times. Yeah. It's like, I mean, we've all been there, right? This is the eighth time I've heard you read this poem. So what the fuck are you doing with your work? You're just gonna, you're gonna ride this out, you know? You've got your one hit and you're gonna keep riding it? No, this is a place for experimentation. It's a testing ground. At, at the same time, um, you know, the, the upside of that, um, turning out to another upside of reading, is with your local, um, you know, group, uh, you can really kick the tires on something that you're trying out, you know? And, and it's important for us to be you know, comradely um, about that and say, okay, well, you know, we're trying to hit before we go out and read the map or wherever we go. And that's a, that's a really good thing. So I think it's very important to um, you know, involve, you know, obviously, the local community. But well, maybe we should turn the same way. So to, speaking, of, yeah. speaking of testing out new work, I've never read this poem before. And we're going to close out with just, we're each going to read one poem. Um, and I've never read this before. And it's, it's very simple. It's a one-line poem. It's called Revisiting the Canyon. Take your favorite book and tape it to a Bible, thus making one new book.
I want to be that one of those poets that reads long and adds for it. I want one of those poetry readers. I want to be that one of those poets who wears loud shirts during performances. I want to be that one of those poets that claps by snap. I want to be that one of those poets that wears black turtlenecks. I want to be that one of those poets that reads poems on OnlyFans. I want to be that one of those poets who hosts a reading in a cinder block building with no AC in July. I want to be that normal poet who laughs at the perfect business card and gets it taken away. I want to be that normal poet who's really just a poor drunk white person from Alabama. I want to be that normal poet who doesn't know how to have fun. I want to be that normal poet who hisses like the snake they are. I want to be that normal poet who's a hot mess on a cruel night. I want to be that normal poet that's been moved to tears by a poem at least once. I want to be that normal poet with no DUIs on their driving record. I want to be that normal poet who works for Morris Clark. I want to be that normal poet who rants on the street corner for free. I want to be that normal poet that cannot figure out how to speak into a microphone. I want to be that normal poet that asks if you can hear them more than once before a reading. I want to be that normal poet who writes poems that make people intellectually horny. I want to be that normal poet who says, How's your mama and them? unironically. I want to be that normal poet who uses public transportation. I want to be that normal poet who is bored by gunshots in their neighborhood. I want to be that normal poet who is a swamp witch. I want to be that normal poet that's never heard of the meters but thinks they're funky. I want to be that normal poet who's running for mayor. I want to be that normal poet that doesn't own a handgun. I want to be that normal poet who writes in the cemetery. I want to be that normal poet that doesn't live in a bywater or marry. I want to be that normal poet who has seen an alligator swimming in Bayou St. John. I want to be that New Orleans poet. I want to be that New Orleans poet. I want to be that New Orleans poet. I want to be, I want to be, I want to be these New Orleans poets, and I am. Because all of you are part of me, and I'm a part of you. And I fucking love it, and I hope you do too. Thank y'all very much. <laughs>